went yeah. pretty deep in the nerd hole. Hello and welcome to Design Chat, the best live design discussion on the internet. I'm your host, Ryan McGovern, on Twitter. I'm at Hoobajoob and at Design Chat. Every once in a while, we get together and we talk to some of the coolest people in the design community and we, uh, we share ideas, we commiserate, we say hello, uh, and we reach out. I mean, already we just started and we've already realized we have more, we have four countries involved. We've got someone from the US, that's me, uh, we have San Francisco, Canada, uh, our guest Alvin is from Sweden and broadcasting from Sweden where it's 3 a.m. in the morning right now and somebody else in the chat room is from Australia. So awesome. Good to see you guys here. Uh, throw up your uh, Twitter uh, names in the uh, chat so everybody can kind of uh, follow everybody. And uh, so this week we're talking to Alvin. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this correctly. Holmsquist Golf Class. That's pretty Thanks pretty for coming. Good, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thanks. Thanks for having me. But I, I specialize it wasn't in bad. that. I, I, I heard worse pronunciations. <laughs> cool. Um, so how this chat came to uh, fruition was that <clears throat> I had seen some of Alvin's work and, and was, it was drool worthy. Um, uh, amazing typography work. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Sweden. We're going to talk about design in Sweden and the differences and stuff. Um, but we usually, Alvin, we start off by having our guests uh, kind of give a brief summary about who they are, what they do, and why they do it. All right. So my name is Albin Holmqvist. Albin Holmqvist, that's how you say it, how you pronounce it in Swedish. Um, 29 years old. Um, I currently live in Stockholm. Um, I used to, I spent about 10 years in Barcelona, Spain before I moved to Stockholm like a year ago. And that's where I got started doing what I do today, which is graphic design and art direction. So I'm uh, hands-on graphic design and art direction as well. So yeah, I, uh, I studied in, in Barcelona for four years, worked at an agency there for two years as well, and got tired of the Spanish way and came back to Sweden. In our so brief conversation, a, a quick... on, yeah, yeah, in, in, over the weekend we talked briefly and you mentioned also that you spent a year in the U.S. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Ooh, that was pretty way back when I was 18. Yeah, when I was 18 I did an exchange year there in Columbia, Missouri. So. I was in the middle of nowhere pretty much, but it was it was really good and I met a lot of cool people there skateboarding and uh, which I'm still really good friends with today and uh, it's it was it was good. It was good. It was crazy, but it was good. Um, and that's all I think that's also interesting because that work that I was just referring to um, was for the EF, uh, the Live the Language um, project that you worked on and essentially yeah. um, I'm probably going to butcher this but the EF um, has to do with traveling for students. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that organization? It's a Swedish organization. It's pretty huge actually and it's I think it's like the biggest language uh, <clears throat> uh, language trip language school program in the world if, if I'm not really tired. But um, it's uh, located here in Stockholm, like the, the main office, and in Switzerland as well. And they have like, over, over 40 destinations like all over the world where they have their own schools and people go there and study. So they're selling the whole language experience with schools in different cities all over the world. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I want, to, I want to mention in the audience real quick, we've got another Twitter account called Design Chat Links. And so as we're referring to things, that account will tweet out, and you can see in the chat room also, uh, links to uh, the subjects we're talking about. So you see one right there to the EF Live the Language uh, on Alvin's homepage. Um, yeah, that's really awesome. And so, and so the project that you worked on was a series of videos, uh, that it's sort yes. of promotional videos to talk, to talk about EF. And, and, and it had to do with you had a video for like every destination. And what was really great was because it was the live the language. Um, you're talking about the culture. Um, it show it. They're kind of like you know short movies, 
that show each uh, destination bits of the culture and as you see the culture sort of go by in the video one word that references the culture comes up and that was of course beautifully uh, illustrated in typography by you so tell us tell us a little bit more history about that project so it started out actually with um i had been doing some music video work for the dop of that uh, of that uh, of those spots Nikla, Nicholas Johansson was his name, he was a super talented guy. So I kind of knew him and uh, he sent me an email. They were coming to Barcelona when I was living there to actually shoot the Barcelona one. So he called me up like, you should come hang out at the hotel, we'll have a beer, we'll shoot the shit. you meet my brother. I went there and I met his younger brother which, who is actually the director of the of those spots, uh, Gustav, mm -hmm. the crazy talented <clears throat> guy. And we hit it off straight up, talking about curb your enthusiasm and drinking a couple of beers and we got along really good. So he just emailed me the next day like, yeah, we're here working on this project and I think it would be a good fit for it. It's uh, like a typography based videos we're making. And he kind of laid it out for me and I was like, sounds awesome, Let's let's do it. So. That's how it all got started, actually. And uh, then they were kind of jumping around in Barcelona, Paris, London, and Beijing. Those were the first four videos we made. And I was like, at the same time, working on the typography from Spain. So it was kind of we're, everything. The first videos were mainly like we were do, creating everything online, pretty much. So I'm, I'm interested to know about, because it seems that in each scenario, in each video that de dealt with the specific destination, <clears throat> you had a very uh, keen knowledge of the local culture that influenced the behavior of the typography, right? And, and it seemed every single one was dead on. So I'm curious about the research that you did. Did you actually travel to some of these locations? How are you influenced to um, to be so keen on those local cultures? I think, uh, obviously, for the Barcelona one, I lived there for, for 10 years. So that was the easiest one, because you, I could just go out on the street and, and see all the signs and the handwritten notes and everything, which was really awesome. But when it comes to the other, like London I've been to, Paris I've never been to, Beijing I've never been to either. but. You know, there's so many resources nowadays. You can just, if you just nerd out, you can you can go deep. And I went yeah. pretty deep in the nerd hole. <laughs> <laughs> That's the quote of the night. I went pretty deep in the nerd hole. <laughs> it's it's sort of like a, a mantra that all designers can sort of live by, right? Because you're right. There there are so many numerous sources. Uh, that you can find if you just keep on digging and keep on trying different search terms um, that it seems <clears throat> you know within a day you can be pretty knowledgeable about just about any subject you want yeah and not also obviously not everything online there's so many markets where you can find old books and type specimens in Barcelona there was this really nice um, secondhand market where you can find like really old type stuff from from way back, Spanish graphic design, but also from from other places where you can pick up and you can have, kind of get the feel and texture of it as well. So that also helps. So not only on online. When whenever we talk to someone who uh, has studied in another country or grew up or lives in another country than the U.S., because um, the audience for Design Chat mostly is from the U.S. I mean, we do get a lot of international stuff. I'm always curious to hear about. The differences in the education, especially when it comes to you know the the creative and, and design educations. Um, so when my first question is, when you traveled, when when you moved to Barcelona, were you doing it with the intent that you wanted to study design specifically in Barcelona, or was that something you discovered while you were there? That is something I discovered, and it was all just a big gamble because I uh, I went there to skate and to study Spanish. We just went uh, a bunch of friends and hung out and did the whole thing for a year or so. A year or so, And 
when they ran out of money, went home, I kind of stayed. And I was all, always interested in growing up with like street art and graffiti and stuff. And then later painting and, and stuff like that. But I always knew I wasn't good enough to actually be able to live as an artist because it's, it's really, really hard. So I was like, so what can I do that's kind of artsy but could also provide like a, a living? And then I was like, graphic design, sure, let's do that. And then I picked up another magazine, I was like, school, okay, let's do that. And then I just went for it. So it was just guesswork pretty much. And you just kind of followed your own path and just, you know, decided on it and dedicated yourself to it. When, when during that sort of discovery, um, did typography itself and, and hand drawing type and studying old type specimens, when did that become important to you and why? I guess it's always been there because I always had a, had a keen eye for letters and stuff like that since, since I was 15 or something like that. But then it kind of went away for a bit and then it came back and, and it was pretty organic because when you, if you, when you, if you study graphic design and if you study four years, there will be a lot of typography, also illustration and stuff like that. But, and then if you study a lot of typography, it kind of just connects with, with me growing up drawing letters, I guess. There's a, a chat participant, Ryan Torgensen, um, who said that in design school, he had a teacher that showed him the, the Live the Language video series as an, expensive, uh, uh, an example of expressive typography. And, and I'm curious about uh, one of the things, once I started doing some searches, um, I realized how much the, the videos and stills from the videos have been shared and reshared re all over the internet. Um, uh, so my question is sort of two-pronged. The first part is um, how, how sort of um, aware of the, the penetration of your work on the internet are you? And the second, um, does it bother you at all that a lot of these sharing sites um, don't really do a good job of crediting who's responsible for the work? Um, what was the first question again? How aware are you of how, how widespread oh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that work has become? It's uh, pretty funny because um, the director, he was, uh, he didn't post them right away when they were done. They were kind of like on YouTube, on the, from, on the EF channel on YouTube first. And then I was like, I, he sent me the final ones and I was like, can I put them up on my Vmail so I can host them for my site? And he was like, sure, go ahead. I put them up there and then just one day someone shared them and it kind of just took off from there because it's, I guess it's really digestible or, and it turned out on like the front page of Vimeo and then everyone watched the video on my channel. So I had, I had like, you can see all the stats and everything. So it was kind of crazy to see how much it, it got shared around. And it was, it's really, really cool to see. But so to answer the question, it's, it's so easy to monitor the, the spreading of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of a piece of work today. So. And also it's, it's, you know, we're not kidding. Like it's fun to see when people look at your stuff, I guess. Does it bother you at all that some of these sharing sites um, that are intended oh, solely if, for sharing that, that there's, it doesn't really, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to track who, who originally did the work. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's, it's all good, I guess, because it's, with that particular work, a lot of people have seen them, and if you you seen many of them, you can kind of put two and two together. So it's not it doesn't really bother me at all. And you know, the, it pops up all kinds of stuff, which is, you know, type overlays on images and stuff like that. So it's 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 popular and it's it's good. I mean, as long as people keep producing cool stuff, I mean, it's it's all good. Um, it seemed like there were a lot of videos. I mean, I'm not sure if I've even seen them all, you know, upwards of 20 or so individual videos that were produced. Um, is that a project that's ongoing? I, I know that it started a few years ago. Um, are there going to be more um, versions of it, more, you know, developments in the series? We, act, we actually just did, we have done seven videos total. We have done 
one, one, the first round was four, and then the second round was three more. EF has okay. kind of made some own like small teaser videos about other stuff, but but That's for now okay. it's uh, but for now it's we're kind of gonna leave it at this for now, and we're working on some other concepts and stuff. But you know we did we did seven films, and for now I think that's it's it's I mean it's a good number. Um, I also saw that you do uh, some motion uh, design also, um, and you were talking earlier a little a little bit about some music video work that you've done. Talk a little bit about your sort of transition from understanding still typography and graphic design to how, how you translate that into your motion work? Uh, as time goes by, I do less and less of the motion part since I really, really want to focus on just art direction and typography, but it is fun to see and work with the, the take it to the next level and when you if you animate stuff or how it works on on moving images and you know making kinetic typography and everything it's really interesting because it's very different from the from the from the printed page or or, or whatever and so you really have to work a lot with legibility timing how 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 far can you take it so it's mostly mostly a legibility issue, I would think. Having done, uh, you know, having had this experience with uh, the EF group, um, and and traveling yourself, uh, learning in Barcelona, living in Sweden, spending a year in the U.S. Would would you say it's important for a young professional um, to do a lot of traveling and international traveling earlier in their career? Definitely, I think I think uh, getting out of your element is is so crucial to just not just professional growth, but but also personal. You know, you meet so many people that they can provide so much, and if you live in uh, like if you just grow up in the same city and you you're faced with the same issues every day, it's you know you you don't evolve as much, I, I guess. And and also you get to meet so many cool people if you travel. So I mean, internet is cool and all, but it's always fun to uh, you know just grab a beer and hang out with hang out with cool people. You know, Sweden has such uh, you know a brilliant and, and illustrious history of of design um, that that's influenced people all over the world, heavily influenced. And I'm curious to know about, um, you know, with growing up in the north of Sweden um, and coming back to live there after you studied, um, is is the history, the design history of Sweden, something that still influences you today? And how do you view that? Um, I wouldn't say since I, when I started out with whatever the, I was doing when I was. Uh, um, when I was young, it wasn't really influenced by art and design per se. It was more just us doing whatever we wanted to do. We just kind of try to figure out, try to figure out how to express ourselves. And and uh, when I got into the design, the graphic design, and this whole world, that was when I was living in Spain. And I lived in Spain for, as I said, like almost ten years. So that's where pretty much where I got. You know the influences and everything. So, so now it's um, it's fun now to come back and see the the contrast because it is pretty different between it between like Spanish graphic design and Swedish graphic design. Even though everyone is connected to the internet, it is pretty different. Um, I used to work at a Spanish agency, Vasava, really awesome agency. They do really illustrative work it's really re super expressive and really good and you know, moving back to stockholm everything is kind of more scaled down it's a little more i wouldn't say sophisticated but more a more minimal approach to it which which really appeals to me but i i guess i me personally i i had to go the expressive route and then kind of scale it back from there 
because if he has that was going to be my next question coming. about about the differences in not so much the um, um, the design styles, but working in a professional environment in Spain and working in a professional environment in Sweden. What are the big, biggest differences in the industry uh, on the business end of it? The business end, um, I would say there's a lot more project managers here. Like you have, uh, you have five project managers for every designer, it seems. In Spain, it's a little more wild west. <laughs> which uh, everything has its pros and cons. But I was, um, my creative director in Spain is called Bruno Sayes. He's the, the founder of Basava and he, he really took me under his wing and kind of showed me the ropes from when I, because I went from school straight to that agency and he teached me a lot about the creative industry in Spain and really showed, showed me how, how it works. And those general rules you can apply to any country, but of, of course there are differences in how the economics and the managing of projects are being handled. So back in Sweden now, are you are you a freelance designer? Are you working with an agency? What's what's your current setup? Both actually. So it's uh, I work as a <clears throat> as an art director. Um, on a, at a creative agency here in Stockholm. We do a lot of commercial work and then I also do my stuff, my other stuff on the side, which, which is more, more my personal, my personal stuff. So I do uh -huh. a double shifter pretty much. <laughs> which is why you're so comfortable being up at 3.24 in the morning in Sweden, <laughs> yeah. which I want to remind the audience about. It's, it's very early. Uh, can you ch turn the camera again and show us that the sunrise, that the sun's coming up right now? Yeah, it's, it's looking show, pretty show the, I got to see it before we started. But look at that. 3.24 in the morning and there's the sun. Look at that. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, got a lot of um, Yeah. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, I know we've got people from Australia and Canada and the U.S. I'm, I'm sure that our understanding and um, uh, sort of viewpoint of IKEA may be different from those of the residents of Sweden. Uh, I was I was curious, you know, and it, IKEA in the U.S. has been interesting to me because it's been sort of like part of a, the big box uh, industry that's come to the US, um, but also like, like a Target or something like that has had an interest in bringing better um, furniture design and, and living design um, and, and those special, uh, specialities uh, to, to the US and, and many different uh, countries. So I'm curious to know about you, how you view a business like that and what it's been able to do. I mean, if IKEA is really, an exceptional example. It's the typical, you swear to God, you will never buy anything from Ikea for your home because it's, you know, every, it's not so personal, but you end up buying everything there because you can't find a <laughs> table and you can't you need some chairs <laughs> and whatever. So, but it, I mean, it, it is, it is good design and it, it, it is, uh, it is, it is really accessible. You can say whatever you want about big, the big businesses and how they run their how they run their business and the founder of IKEA yeah. having ties to not really ties, but he was involved with the Nazi Germany and shit like that. So it is what it is. Yeah, I mean to be to accomplish anything on, on that level, and um, you know you you kind of take the good with the bad. Um, but you know, the, as as far as bringing design into the context of mainstream culture, I'm always for that, and and so I thought it was you know it, it was something to be noted and, and talked about. Um, sure. We're running about halfway through the show right now. We're going to start taking questions from the audience. Um, uh, I wanted to let me, let me look over my notes real quick and see if there's anything else. Uh, well, we can come back to that stuff. Um, so sure. again, let me remind the audience for people who are just joining us now. Um, you can ask questions in two ways. You can either 
Uh, you, both of them start by clicking on the red submit a question button on the right hand side of the screen um, and you can either type it in and then we hit accept and it comes up on the screen. You'll see that an example of that in a moment. Or if you've got a webcam, you can actually get on camera just like the both of us and be part of the conversation. So please do that. We've got two questions waiting in the wings right now. The first one is from Ryan Pernofsky, who wants to know, do you have any uh, future projects in... Uh, I'm still here. Yeah, I just right. sorry, I, f I forgot to warn you that I can I can switch screens and stuff. So I just did it so oh, your yeah, screen no, is yes, bigger. The, the, the audio got cut out. Future ah. projects, yeah, we got a bunch of uh, we got a bunch of fun stuff in the in the pipeline now. Um, new EF work. Um, we're, as we're actually working on that now. A couple new films, a whole different concept, not as heavily on the typography as last time, but there, there are some good stuff. But then, you're, then we really bring the typography into, the, into reality with more printed stuff. And so that's going to be pretty cool. This, that will be out at the end of the summer, I assume. And then just um, different type typography-based stuff. I've been lucky to have, a <clears throat> to have some fun projects coming my way. And, uh, some motion based and some printed and uh, yeah I think I will uh, I will try to uh, launch a new website in the fall with a bunch of new stuff so I can I can show what I've been doing the last couple of couple of months very cool um, I'm always curious about um, uh, designers who have a, a root and a history in printed work um, and and how well or not well they've been able to make the transition to web is that something uh, do you do you program your own sites do you get into programming at all um, are you involved in the back end are you interested at all, in it at all I do uh, I, I do design a lot for for the web and also mobile applications and all like that and you know, when it comes to when it comes to design, it's you can apply the same thinking, obviously. Uh -huh. uh, when it comes to the technical parts, I'm I'm fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of my good programmers that make my life a lot easier. I just give them shitty PSD files, and they get mad for five minutes, and then they, they put it into <laughs> put it into work. Um, on that subject. Um... Can you talk a little bit about uh, can you talk a little bit about how the tools of design affect your work, uh, be they a digital or analog? So um, the actual production of how how you work. It depends. It depends a lot on on the look we're going for. With the, when we talk about typography and stuff like that, it's do you want to have a clean look or do you want to have a little more rugged look and Lately, I've been doing a much more hand rendered type with different using different uh, different sorts of materials just to kind of take it to the next level because there are ways to digitally like mimic letterpress effects and stuff like that. But you know, it's always a lot nicer to just do it do it yourself by hand. It's it's much more fun. So, but uh, it, I it's the the tools are secondary, um, and so it it depends on what on the look. Thank you, Mitch, for your question. Good question, Mitch. Totally. Uh, I think one of the, I'm gonna start including a, a new um, segment on the show. Um, and I probably should have warned you about this ahead of time, um, but I wanted to, to, to be sort of like a tip section, um, a, a tip or a trick that has to do with, with the creation, what, what you're doing, well, <clears throat> be it, uh, you know, whether it's on the computer or um, a special way of um, scanning something uh, that, that, that works good for you, something that you, something that you depend on, um, that others might be able to... Uh, 
uh, experiment with in their own work? Something, oh, it's kind of hard just off the top. It's a little tricky when you can't show it. But um, when it comes to to the digital stuff, um, like different di different uh, letter effects and stuff in Illustrator, it's always you can always uh, use a lot of clipping pads and stuff like that to create different shading effects and stuff like that. I've been doing a, a, a lot of that lately. It's just kind of you have your word mark and you can just you duplicate it and you move it and then you can fill that with different stuff and kind of work with different layers and layers and uh, different uh, line blends and stuff like that which actually put into that clipping mask so that's really technical but you can get some fun you can get some fun depth um, with those techniques I, no, I like that you're getting technical with it because, I mean, those little nuances, those little um, maneuvers uh, are usually what makes the work unique. Um, uh, one of the things I'm always curious about with, with seeing type work like yours is, um, like you were referring to earlier, um, there are ways to create um, digitally w what looks analog, right? Um, so if it looks mm. like it comes off a, a press, um, it, it really looks like it came off a press. And it sounds like you're actually starting to create some of it, um, you know, via analog, right? And using old, old pieces of type and then finding a way to get that into your computer, you know, via either scanning or I'm, I'm not sure exactly how. Um, but I'm always curious about the, the best maneuvers to be able to do that. I can... Uh... I can show you if you hang on for just one second. Sure. I'll give you a little trick. And I want to remind so the audience. Let's uh, take ask an example. If you, Go ahead. If you look at this, uh, uh, I posted in the comment section now, like in the or in the chat section, a project I did for a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, what I did there was, you know, I decided you designed the. Uh, you design the type mark digitally and then you print it out on like a really old shitty printer and then there's this uh, there's a special type of liquid that's really toxic it's called uh, trichlorotileno in Spanish I don't know what the what the Tri trichloride is, something it, you can you can yeah and you can use it to make a transfer you just put your shitty print on another page and you rub it with that with this alcohol thing and you get a really, really nice transfer oh, cool. effect to it, which is really easy to do at home. So that's uh, and then you, you know what I just and I just it. read a um, I just read a blog post about this on a how to site, and I think it was that same uh, chemical. And th what they were showing how to do is you print out a photo on a laser printer on regular paper and use that use that chemical, um, and you can do the transfer onto. A uh, piece of wood board, um, and it transfers the photo, uh, of course, opposite mm -hmm. of of what you have. Um, it worked really nice in black and white, but also it gave it gave it a really nice effect because it it the ink is pulling itself off of the paper and being applied to the wood. So you see the wood grain through all of it. There's a transparency effect, and I'm pretty sure I'm pretty awesome. sure he was using either that chemical or a, a similar chemical, um, and then they were doing. They were doing multiple transfers where they would do image and then type on top of it. It was really, really cool. I'll have to find it, mm, and uh, I'll nice, tweet that link out later. Nice. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, I, I can see in the comment section that the, the guys there know pretty much what I'm talking about. So it's not, like, it's not a secret trick or anything, but it's just nice to you know, get your hands dirty. Totally. Uh, we got a couple not, more questions. Not here. tweeting jokes. <laughs> uh, from Hiawatha. Uh, on Twitter, uh, curious about uh, what you go to for inspiration, music, paintings, other design, architecture. Well, uh, all of them, I would say. Like now, I was uh, music. I listen to a lot of old jazz and stuff, and it really gets me in the in the mood. So I was working with that now, doing some some stuff and uh, architecture. Danish architecture is really nice. Um, 
I have a friend in Copenhagen that designs skate parks or street plazas. He's really talented and how he works with space and how people interact with that space and it's, it's really interesting and you know you can find you can find inspiration in anything. I, I guess it's it's a it's a good question. It's a hard one because there's so many. Another question here from Jen Shen at Twitter. Uh, how do you ask for feedback on your designs and who do you ask? I, I got two guys or three three guys that I one is uh, my my former boss or friend and uh, two other friends. I just send them there if I I know pretty much what what works if, if it's if it's uh, like on a general scale you can pretty much figure out what works and what doesn't but if you if you need some more specific advice I just send I have these three guys that I always send stuff to and they just get back to me and say this one sucks and this one is good so <laughs> so I have I have a I have a trifecta yeah it's always good to have your but, your yeah reliable sources to go to. Um, uh, there's nothing more frustrating than being in the middle of a process and not not being able to get the feedback you need or, and you know if you're questioning your own work how to get back to the place. I mean because there are so many emotional highs and lows that happen throughout mm. any project um, that you sort of have. It's a mental game. Not only is it physical in creating the visuals and understanding the, the cultural references that you're using uh, and all of the other parameters um, but it's also a, a sort of emotional game um, that you have to play as a designer about how you feel about the work. Yeah, and it's funny you should say that because I'm uh, uh, my girlfriend. I've been we've been together for yeah almost ten years, and she knows me and she knows my work, and she's also visually oriented, but not a designer at all. But she always has like, okay, what you're doing now it looks a lot like what you were doing there. And I was like, no, it doesn't. And then like, <laughs> it does. And then I have to scrap it and start. So she doesn't hold back. So it's good to have someone to just slap you upside the head when you're repeating yourself. That's awesome. Um, getting back into the sort of Swedish culture of design, um, in, in the very little research that, that I was able to do, um, uh, and I say that because I know that there's, there, there's so much more that I can learn. Um, I saw something that was interesting, this group, it's called the Svensk Form, um, and the web website is, uh, I'll type it in there, it's, it's Svensk, svenskform.se, hold on, S, S V E N S K F O R M dot S E. It's, it's a government mandated group. Um, that supports essentially craft and design, um, and, and I thought that I thought that was really interesting because it it seemed like a really legitimate source of support um, for those professions, um, not only in honoring it but educating about it um, and, and making sure that it's it's part of a culture like a mainstream culture, way more than it seems like the U.S. would ever be aware of or capable of doing. Um, and I'd just like to know your sort of reflections on um, how much more of design and, and, and architecture and, and essentially um, professional creative arts uh, that, that Sweden has as a culture. I mean, it, it is really, it is impressive when you come back here after you've been gone for a while and to see, to see how how valued it is, good, good design, good art, and every everything like that. There are two sides to every coin, and I think there there. I feel that there are two tracks when it comes to the more creative industry. One is the the more entrepreneurial, uh, ad agency based, yeah, five project managers to every designer way that doesn't honor the graphic design or design at all but then there are also these cultural institutions which is really amazing and uh, here in Stockholm there's a couple of museums that, like Museum of Modern Art and the Photographic Museum and 
there there's so many and they're so good so it's it's really valued and uh, it's nice but there are also the other side that is there are a lot of money grabbing entrepreneurs that doesn't really care about the design they just <coughs> care about you know making Excuse the money me. um to to have accomplished what you have so far uh, the work that you do, both agency side and freelance side, um, you have had to put in, uh, I'm sure, countless hours of practice, study, um, making mistakes, um, trying again. Um, that has amounted to, I'm sure, uh, a great portion of your life. If you had to choose another craft, that you would invest that much time, money, and effort into uh, that might direct your life in a different way, what craft would that be? Well, it's funny, uh, good question, because I actually, I kind of entertained that thought a lot, because I grew up doing a lot of different stuff with music and skating, still skate, of course, but... Um, but also something completely different. Like, could I be a could I be a doctor? Could that be? Obviously, I couldn't because I could study so hard. But I always uh, entertained the thought of just doing something completely different, or just doing something that's more uh, more of a craft, more of a something something real. I don't know. And and until you find that, do. you know, you yeah yeah, you, it, and make that decision, and it you know it's to to be able to accomplish and achieve what you have and the level that you have, it's it's a complete dedication and and, and a, I'm sure a big portion of your life, um, and I'm I'm always curious about hearing those stories from uh, from designers because usually the good designers do have other interests, they have other parts of their life that have heavily influenced how they uh, create images and how they um, uh, observe culture. Um, and I'm always cu curious to hear about I what. I think it's. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, it's 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 interesting because it's uh, I totally agree, and I think you need to have. You have to have something else, that could, just. You know, you need a you need some sort of release because you can't be, in 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 the design twenty four hours a day. 365 days a year. It doesn't matter how fun it is. You need to. You need something else to to just get a different perspective on things. So, I have skateboarding and some other stuff, and which really really clears my mind to just approach a problem in a whole and see everything in a different light, which is really helpful. So I think that's really important. Totally agreed. 100% agreed. Um, <clears throat> We have about 10 minutes left in the chat. Um, I'm going to make one more uh, call for questions from the audience, uh, and then we'll start wrapping it up. Um, a, a quick announcement. We are going to be doing a chat um, next week, um, a place to keep up with what is going on with Design Chat is designchat.info slash upcoming. Um, and if you go there now, you can see that next week, uh, because the Wednesday is the 4th of July, which is a nat national holiday for us, um, we're going to be doing the chat on Tuesday, and we're going to be talking to Doug Bartow. Uh, he's a principal and di design director at ID29. Uh, so check them out at ID29.com. Um, and he's uh, Doug Bartow on Twitter. So look him up in the meantime and start thinking about questions for him, too. So... Um, I'm not seeing any more questions coming from the audience, so I think it's time to wrap up here. Alman, thank you so much for spending this time with us, and more so for staying up until 3 friggin' a.m. in the morning to do this. I really appreciate it. I'm sure the audience appreciates it, and we definitely appreciate all, uh, all of your work and look forward to seeing uh, what you do in the future. Thanks so much. Uh, really nice talking to you guys and uh, honored to be chosen for the design chat. Awesome. Um, you can follow him on Twitter at Albin uh, uh, Holmquist. Quist. I screwed it up again. Uh, and uh, his no, website. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Albinholmquist.com. 
Um, and we, we can't wait to see what you got going on in the future. Definitely reach out and uh, let's keep on chatting. Yeah, for sure. Have a good, uh, good night and thanks everyone for tuning in. And uh, we'll continue talking on Twitter, I guess. Definitely. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Design Chat at Hoobajoo. Uh, that's it for tonight. Good night, everybody. Peace. And I went pretty deep in the third hole.